All right. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome back out to your second help in a Fellowship Baptist Church. Let's take a songbook and stand. 283. 283. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let's stand and sing. 283. Joy unspeakable. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory has never yet been told Woo, i gotta wake up amen i had a good nap i hope you did too this is a little fast pace i have found the pleasure i once craved i have found the pleasure i once craved it is joy and peace within what a wondrous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory in the half has never yet been told. Number four. I have found the joy no tongue can tell, how its waves of glory roll. It is like a great or wellwing well, springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, oh, the half has never yet been told. Good evening. Amen. We have a lot of people to pray for. Um, just keep Miss Linda Blevins in your prayers as she is just uh, not recovering well from surgery. She's just prayed for her. I don't know what I'll say, but it's just in Delang. They're not here tonight. And he's been, uh, he came this morning, which was a shock. He's had, yeah. he's been really sick with shingles. It got inside of him. Um, so just pray for some of these. I've got a list over there, and it just seems to keep growing. But uh, pray for these. I know it's just uh, seems like one thing after another. But uh, good to have you here tonight. Good to see Brother Tom Poindexter with us tonight. Amen. And uh, goes love in Baptist Temple. Good to see him here this evening. And I'm going to ask Brother Monashed if he'd lift up his voice and pray for us this evening. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 All right. Keep your songbooks handy. 250. 250. He keeps me singing as I go. 250. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. And all life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life, all my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken streams, stirred the struggling courts again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every 
Keeps me singing as I go, feasting on the riches, feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath the shelter always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Number five, soon he's coming back, soon he's coming back to Welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall reign with light to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Feels my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Yep, if you don't see someone here, pray. I know Brother Carrico is out, his family's out singing. And um, pray for them on the road. But, uh, Brother Sauce, why don't you pray for us this evening? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, uh, by way of announcements, uh, Fellowship Track League, they will be having a work day this Tuesday, so come on out, break some tracks if you can. Uh, this Friday, we're having a fall festival, and I believe it, uh, help me because I don't have my bulletin with me, 530, and uh, we will have food and games, amen, thank you, sir, and uh, Friday the 21st. And it'll be at 5.30, and uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. So for what you're going to bring as far as a meal to pass, chili beans, desserts, hot chocolate, just num-nums, in, in my daughter's words, num-nums. So uh, sign up to bring some num-nums, okay? And we'll have a large time here at Friday, uh, the 21st. That's so this Friday. And uh, Veterans Dinner is coming around the corner. Uh, it is going to be November the 6th. And uh, invite a veteran, try to bring one along and say, look, we're having a special meal just for you that served in the military and then uh, come on downstairs and eat with them. OK, and so try to get them in here to the house of God. And so I uh, want to honor the veterans on Veterans Day and uh, see if we can uh, be a blessing to them. So, uh, yes, if uh, invite a veteran for November the 6th, it'll be a veterans dinner that day. Like I said, even if you didn't serve, but you're with a guest that did serve, stay with them and eat, okay? Uh, I believe that was about it. The missionary of the week was the uh, Tay and Rebecca, say it? Miasta. Miasta. I got to say it Japanese, Miasta. And we covered them this morning in Sunday school and keep them in your prayers. And the uh, ministry of the week was the custodian and the maintenance department, and uh, praise the Lord for folks that clean the church and try to keep the church healthy, running, and going. So uh, I think that's it by way of announcements. 
Let's take our songbook once more and turn to 300. 300. Oh, say, but I'm glad. They, they played that. 300. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Let's stand together if you can. 300. There is a song in my heart today, something I never had. Jesus has taken my sins away. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Wonderful, marvelous, wonderful, marvelous love he brings into a heart that's sad. Through darkest tunnels the soul can sing. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Won't you come? Oh, won't you come to him with all your care? Weary and worn and sad. You too will sing as his love you share. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Well, Greenlee, we'll give you a choice. Normally we take up a birthday offering that Sunday night, but we're missing a lot of folks tonight. If you want to wait till next Sunday night, you might get some more greenbacks, or we can do it tonight. All right, there you go. Wise choice. I think, amen. You may be seated, amen. Amen. I'm looking out for your best interest. Amen. Who cares about other people? Hey. All right, we uh, <clears throat> we did recently find out that we have a small, very small portion, but it's showing itself that we have a little bit of Jewish heritage. So that uh, yeah, we'll give that the credit for wanting to wait till next Sunday. Uh, the song we want to, to do tonight, we've known of it for a while, but we heard someone sing it at Brother Drummond's, and it really did something for me the other night. Um, just looking back and over the years and thinking, you know, uh, I don't have the greatest track record of being faithful to God, but he's always been faithful to me. I 
is my song, the theme of the story I've heard of so long. God has been faithful, He will be again. His loving compassion, He knows no heard that in a long time either and then when we were at the meeting I was like man that was good I was going to ask them to try to learn that song that's that's a blessing that they sang it amen oh yeah pray Linda Blevins isn't doing good of course brother Delang keep Jill Tolbert in your prayers Jack Schuler, keep him in your prayers as well and uh you know he's not he's not been here but um also um pray for Mickey Ring he's not feeling good but uh, he is his son's uh, well, his grandchildren's other grandfather passed away suddenly of a massive heart attack. So he's not here today because he's not doing well himself. But he's going to go to the funeral, which is early this week down in the Carolinas, and I think it's in North Carolina. So unless they live in Florida now, but I think it's in North Carolina they live. Yeah. So pray for them. Um, so he's going to be heading down there and hopefully be back by Wednesday. He said, but. Pray for that, amen. It seems like one thing after another, amen. And uh, your Bible is turned to the book of Exodus, amen. Exodus chapter 17. And I gave you a heads up about it was what, what is about this morning, and it is about holding up Moses' hands, all right. And I was just sitting there in the service, and the gentleman, nobody was preaching on that time. I, somebody brought this passage up during the week over there, but I just, it's just like God just brought up one thing after another. And there's a lot of ways you can take this, and I'm not going to, I mean, I'm, there's several ways you can preach this text. But uh, talking about Aaron and her when they held up Moses' hands there, when, that, when they came out, Amalek, Amalek came out and uh, really fought with Israel and Rephidim. And um, I think Rephidim means a, really a place of rest, too. And here they are at a place of rest, and they get attacked by the enemy. And Moses, the man of God, as we know, is going to go up to the top of the hill. He's going to have the rod of God in his hands, and he's going to hold it up. Well, let's go ahead and begin reading in Exodus chapter 17 in verse 8. And I just want to say this as we get into this. You know what? When you think about what's going on here, Lives are at stake. The nation of God, God's people, all that's at the stake here. And Moses has been leading them, of course, out of Egypt, right? And now they're out. And up to now, God's fought all of their battles for them. 
He's fought all of their battles for them. This is the first time that they're going to have to fight. He's going to fight through them. You know, he's going to, obviously, he's the one that's going to give the victory. And it's obvious in what's going on. But let's begin reading verse 8. So then came Amalek. And now who is the descendant of Amalek? Amalek is a descendant of Esau. Okay, so you have, a, a, what a picture of the flesh. Esau was profane. Paul talks about him being profane because he thought so little of spiritual things. So here is, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, and here, this is the first time you see Joshua's name brought up. And he's probably early 40s, you know, and it says, Choose us out, men, go and go fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. And so Joshua did, as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand and Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and the one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of, for, of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Wow. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help me get across what you laid on my heart this week. Lord, and just God help us. And uh, Father, we look at Aaron and her as they, they helped them. They were fellow helpers, co-laborers, helping Moses in this battle. But there are all kinds of people in st at stake and people that are involved with it. I just pray it help for me to get across what you laid on my heart this week. And Father, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, again, up to this point, they didn't have to fight. Now, let me say this. Do I, I do believe that he is praying. Moses goes up to the mount. He's got the rod of God in his hands. And I, I should have brought that rod that uh, Wayne gave me a rod from Florida that time. I should have brought it in today. But he's got this rod in his hands, and Moses is at the top of the hill. And Joshua, you got to like all the characters. All of God's children are fighting, right? They're all in the battle. Joshua's leading them in the battle. Moses is on top of that hill holding the rod of God up. What does that represent? It represents a couple things. Number one is that Moses is up there praying. He's interceding for Israel. You say, where do you get that from? I'm glad you asked. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And when he's praying up there on top of that, that hill, and he's got the rod of God in his hand, what does that picture? It pictures that Moses has complete and utter dependence upon God. If he's up there holding up the rod of God, all right, he's praying to God. He's obviously saying, God, we cannot win this victory without you. So you got a man of God that's got utter dependence upon God, praying over the children of God, and Joshua's leading in the fight down in the valley. Amen? And that's the picture you got here. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 8. Is what Paul told the preacher boy. He said, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up, there's three things you're going to bring up, holy hands, without wrath, and doubting. What's holy hands? First thing, holy hands, those are clean hands. A lot of times you see they talk about lifting up holy hands in the Bible. That's talking about clean hands. In other words, you're right with God. You're, you don't have sin in your life. You've gotten right with God. You've got a clean slate. He talks about without wrath. What's that mean? Your heart's clean with other men. You're not holding a grudge against somebody. You're not angry in your heart towards other brethren. That You know, when we lift up our hands to heaven with clean, holy hands, and we don't have wrath in our heart, that means we're not sitting here holding bitterness and grudges. How in the world can we pray and ask God for something when we sit here and hold bitterness in our heart towards other people? And then he says, without doubting, what's that? Praying by faith. 
We know we're supposed to have faith. When we pray without faith, it's impossible to please him. So anyways, you see Timothy talking about lifting up holy hands. They used to always lift up holy hands. I could take you to Solomon. I could take you to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. I could take you to 1st or 2nd Kings there. And when they prayed, what their hands were spread out to heaven. That's just how they used to pray back then. Well, you know, lifting up those holy hands toward heaven. So there's Moses on top of that hill, utter dependence upon God, and he's praying. He's making intercession for his children. And let me say, I know a lot of people say, well, this is a type of Christ. And you could say that. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us. But let me just say this. The Lord never gets tired. The Lord don't need our help. <laughs> so, though it may be a type of Christ, it's not a good one. If I was to have any kind of a type of anything, it would almost be the under-shepherd. What's that? The pastor. Why is that? Because the pastor gets tired. The pastor is just a man. And I think that, to me, that is what this is the best type of, uh, not, not the Lord Jesus Christ who never gets tired and doesn't really need your help. You could say, well, when he was in flesh, well, still, you could say that, but I don't think it's a very good type. But then, nonetheless, we go on. He's interceding for Israel. Now, look at, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So there they are, though, Aaron and her aiding Moses. Right? They're aiding them, holding them hands up. Well, in 2 Corinthians, he talks about us doing the same thing. Look at chapter 1, verse 11. He said, Ye also, helping together by prayer for us, that the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. What does that mean? I mean, they're basically what? The bottom line is, is they go through all these trials and you know what? God delivered them. All these people are praying for uh, Paul. And it's basically just like what you see here with Moses, Aaron, and her. Now, I am going to take, I'm just going to preach what God laid on my heart. I've had people tell me, preacher, I feel that God has got me here to hold your hands up. I want to thank you for that. That's a blessing. It's just to hear those words is encouraging to me. I'll tell you what, you think about the battle that they were in. Amalek, descendant of Esau, it's just a picture of the flesh. We're in a greater battle. You know why? We're in a spiritual battle. And we don't wrestle flesh and blood, right? We know Ephesians 6, we are in a spiritual battle. And what's is at stake for us? The souls of men. All of eternity, the church is at stake. Families are at stake. And I'll be honest, I, I make intercession for you. You got children you want prayer for? I have prayed for them. I have. I've interceded. I've prayed. I've lifted them up. You know, Ephesians 6, 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Listen, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. They were. We're in a greater battle. We're in a spiritual battle. And I'll tell you what, uh, I, for those of you and those of you who say, man, I, I want to hold those hands up. I want to I look at Moses tonight, and I want you to see the man, probably Moses, in a different light. And uh, this is just something the Lord laid on my heart, because you say, I want to hold them hands up. I thank you. And uh, I need it. I'll be honest. I need it. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Now, as you go there, I'll tell you a little story. I remember President Bush. George Bush? Yeah, George Bush. George Bush was at the airport. And there was this old guy with a beard. Huh? Did he say that on Wednesday? Tell me he did. Did he say that? No, good. All right. So anyways, he's at the airport, and there's this old guy with a beard. And he goes, hey, he's got tablets in his hand. Looks like the Ten Commandments. He goes, that guy looks like Moses. And he says, are you Moses? And the guy doesn't say a word. And he goes, he gets up to him closer, and he hollers in his face, hey, are you Moses? And he doesn't say a word. Finally, he looks at a Secret Service agent. He goes, does that guy look like Moses to you? He goes, it does. 
That looks like Moses. He goes, he will not respond to me. And the secret service agent walked up to him and he goes, hey, are you Moses? He goes, I am. He goes, well, why wouldn't you respond to him? He says, the last time I talked to Bush, he goes, I wandered in the desert for 40 years. Amen. We're going to tell you the whole story. Amen. Oh, anyhow, Exodus chapter 3, look at verse 10. I want to show you these because, you know, you think about the man whose hands they're holding up. You say, Moses, the man of God. That's what the Bible calls him, the man of God. Yeah, well, let's look at Moses, the man of God. First off, in Exodus 3.10, 3.11, he says, Come now, therefore, he says, I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Wait a minute now. I want you to know this. You say, Why are you reading this? Because I want you to understand the man whose hands they're trying to hold up is a man called of God to do the job. He's called of God to lead his people. Go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 4. I mean, he is a man called of God to lead God's children. Look at chapter 4. Look at verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, neither since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, I want you to just hold on. You can go with me to hold your place there a minute, okay? I'll tell you what, I'll read these verses. You write these down. Because Brother Starter, we announced this morning, is going to get ordained January 16th, all right? Tell you what, when a man surrenders to the ministry, maybe it's whether it's a pastorate or whatever the full time position is, he's called of God. Now, listen to Acts chapter 13 and verse 2 and 3. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, oh, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands upon them, they sent them away. Listen, when God calls a man, the man knows it. And when God calls a man, the Holy Ghost knows it. Yeah. And when God calls a man, the church knows it. And when God calls a man, the devil knows it. And the fight is on. And I could take you to other places in the Bible to show you that when a man surrenders even to the office of pastorate, how the devil, I mean, literally the Holy Ghost is on him in a sense of a, you can call it anointing, you can call it what you want. But the bottom line is, the devil knows it. And the fight is on. You know, but I, I, I read those verses that we just looked at, and I want to bring this up. I read those verses not just to show you the calling of God on Moses' life. What was, what was Moses' response? Here, God says, I want you to lead my people out. Glory to God, I've been waiting for you to call me. I know I can do it. I'm the man for the job. No, that's not what he said. He said, uh, <laughs> I think you got the wrong guy here. Yeah. What's he, you know what? He, you can, I mean, you read that all out. Moses felt inadequate to do the job. The man that them guys are holding his hands up that day with the rod of God, he felt inadequate. I couldn't tell you how many people, young men, I mean, even older men that feel called to preach, they come up to you. They go, oh, man, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'll tell you this. I, I feel called to preach. Okay. I had a young man at camp one time, and he just he kept going on. He talked to me for 45 minutes. He goes, I don't know what's wrong. I said, okay, you talk, son. He talked. He just kept talking, and every word was preach, 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 preach. And I sat there and looked at him, and I said, you get it figured out? He goes, he starts crying, and he goes, I'm called to preach. You think, well, glory to God. You think he's going to run the aisles and go, hallelujah, I'm called to preach. Most men that are called to preach feel very inadequate of it. Oh, there's some that think that they're God's gift to the world. Don't get me wrong. and They may be, all right? But most people go, they're counting the cost, and there's a cost. 
and they don't feel adequate. And you know what? Moses didn't feel adequate. And if you're holding my hands up, when I surrendered to preach, I certainly didn't feel adequate. I didn't go for over a decade. I didn't because a guy got up in our church. I, was, I, was, I felt called the first year I was saved. And a guy had come to our church and he preached. He said, there's a lot of guys going into the ministry. They can't do anything else. I thought, well, maybe that's what I'm trying to do. I'm going to the ministry because I can't do anything else. And God gave me a good job. I made great money. I was a journeyman car mold maker. And God said, I want you to preach. And I'm sitting there looking at my farm going, well, I don't know now. Now I've got a beautiful farm. But you start, you realize, man, you don't feel adequate. And I'll tell you what, Moses here, the man of God, he doesn't feel adequate. But you know what? Moses would be right and Moses would be wrong. And every preacher that feels that way is right and every preacher is wrong. I'll tell you why. Look, look at Exodus chapter 3, look at verse 12. Well, God's calling him to do the job. And he said, certainly I will be with thee and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. But he says, look, I'm going to be with you. And everyone that's called to preach, everyone is called to be in ministry full time, whether it's the young ladies that we support on the mission field of, of uh, uh, oh, that's one, but uh, I'm thinking of care. Thank you, Ivory Coast. Great memory. I've got a memory like a track. That's right there and right there. <laughs> hey, it does, you know what? You may feel inadequate. And you are right. You are inadequate. And, but I, just, I say that because of this, because you say, man, I'm, I want to hold you up, preacher. I, I really do. I want to support you. I want to hold up them hands like they did Moses. Well, Moses felt inadequate. And I'll tell you what, maybe you're visiting from our church. Most preachers feel inadequate. He said, oh, not my pastor. He, he's so confident, and you'd be shocked. When you go to a preacher fellowship, You'd be surprised how many guys, they're not kidding when they tell you they quit every Monday morning. They're not kidding. Because they battle, they, they don't, you know, just being honest with you. That's the man that you're trying to hold up. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, I'll, yeah, we'll read a couple of verses here, but I want to, we're going to wind up in 1 Corinthians as well. Go to 1 Corinthians, I'll hold your place there. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The man they're holding their hands of felt totally inadequate. Now, when he was young and he was full of himself, and God was not in a position to be able to use him, he thought he could do it on his own power and strength, and he, he, ended up, he did end up running and hiding in the backside of the desert. Amen. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul was dealing with a trial in his life. And he said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, look at verse 9. He says, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, the truth of the matter is, when a man like a Moses, and I'm not, I'm not comparing myself or any preacher that I know to Moses. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. When they feel inadequate, if you feel called to the ministry and you go, man, I feel inadequate, well, that's actually a good place to be because that's when God can use you and can empower you because it's then and then only when you're really relying upon God's power, not your own. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You may ask, why did God call Moses? I, I don't doubt they actually had a slow speech. I don't know. I might have been a lame excuse. I don't know. He said that he did and... God said, I made your tongue, so God didn't tell him, no, you didn't, don't have a slow speech. I don't doubt he might have had a slow speech, you know, he, what he said. Why did God call Jonah, you know? Jonah, man, I mean, guy backslides on God anyways and doesn't even do the will of God. Why does God call anybody, you know? Well, look at this here. I mean, some of the people that I know are called to preach, I go, you know, you go, wow, look, look at their back and their past, you know. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 26. He says, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world which are despised hath God chosen, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ, who of God is made unto wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Can you imagine honestly... Moses must be a man of slow speech. God doesn't correct him. Can you imagine that man? Maybe he stutters. I've got friends that stutter. Uh, uh, um, God, God, God said, let my people go. Maybe he talks slow. I don't know. Can you imagine the, the Pharaoh looking at Moses with a man with a speech impediment? And I know Aaron's talking for him, but Moses talked too. Can you imagine that? I bet he looked at him like he's a fool. But when the water turned to blood, the flies and the locusts, by the time the firstborn were all dead, guess what? Who got glory for that? God did. And every God time, God takes some young guy that feels totally inadequate. My pastor couldn't even give a speech in class. Pastored for 50 years. I mean, there's men all over this country. They got, you go, you got to be kidding me. God's going to use that individual? What happens? Well... Well, God takes somebody like that, Jack Shooter, we talked about him this morning, old heroin addict, gets saved, God used him, guess what, preached all around this country, people got saved, who got glory for that? It wasn't Jack Shuler. he wasn't some speech expert, God got the honor and glory for that. But anyways, the man that you see them holding the hands of, he felt so inadequate. And so do most men that are called of God to the ministry. Let's go to Numbers chapter 20, we'll look at a, another point here. Numbers chapter 20, the man whose hands they're holding. Now, this is interesting. Now, you say, why are you going here? Oh, look at this. There's so many things I could bring up on Moses. Now, no, Numbers chapter 20, there was no water for the congregation. Verse 2. Numbers 20, verse 2. There was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we died when our brethren died before the Lord. Oh, man. Wow. I mean, they're chewing Moses out. They wish they were dead. They don't really wish they were dead, but they're mad. They're upset. They're thirsty. And the Lord spake unto Moses in verse 7. Jump on down to verse 7. He says, Take the rod... And gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth its water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. Now it's important that you know, and I know many of you know the text. He said, speak to the rock. The rock's a picture of Christ. Already there's been a rock in view in the book of Exodus 17, actually, that when they were needing water, God said, smite the rock. It's a picture of Christ. But look at verse, look at verse uh, 9. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And look at verse 10. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. Now listen to what is said here now. He said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. No, God didn't tell them to do none of that. God had never told them to call them rebels and chew them out. He says, Hear now, ye rebels, must we. Now all the emphasis is off God. All the emphasis is now on Moses. Must we, him and Aaron, must we fetch water out of the rock for you? Wow. What happened to Moses here? He's kind of, he's at wit's end, I guess. Don't just think of what's going on. Must we fetch water out of this rock? God didn't tell him to do that. It tells you and it shows you how angry it is. He takes credit for himself. Instead of directing the people to God and talking to the rock like God says, he's over here chewing the people out. He said, must we get your water? You're not getting any water, Moses. God's going to do this, you know. And then he does something, though. He, you know the text. He, verse 11, it says, Moses lifted up his hand 
and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. Wow. You know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, And did all drink of that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that's what he says. Amen. Now, what, you know what Moses just did? Moses blew it. You say, well, preacher, why would you read that about Moses? To show you Moses was not a perfect man. You know the man they're holding the hands to over there? He ain't a perfect man. You say, preacher, I'm behind you, I'm supporting you. I'm not a perfect man. I'm just a man. Amen. There's one perfect one. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at verses 12 and 13 of Numbers chapter 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses. I mean, he really got on, I mean, he suffered. He suffered some serious consequences for his pride and his sin here. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, said, Because you believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. That's huge. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of water strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. I don't doubt that Moses was worn out with these people. But you know what? God did not allow that to be an excuse. That man was not allowed to go into Canaan land. He got to go up and see it. Got up on the mountain, got a chance to see it. There's a whole message just on that thought. But I'll tell you what, I read all that for one reason, to show you that Moses wasn't perfect. Moses failed God. You know, if you tell me, he's a preacher, uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I've got your hands, I'm, I'm supporting you, I'm holding you up in prayer. I want you to realize that I'm not a perfect man. And the longer you know me, the more you know me, you think, maybe on my best day. You know what? I, it's sad tonight. There's some going tonight. But by the grace of God, I, on their best day, I could sit and name names. Their best day, when they came here hungry, you know what? I seen them get saved. I preached the word. They heard the word. They got saved. I know there's some, maybe, I don't know why, they, maybe not, they can't be here tonight. I don't know. I know some work, and they, they go to bed early and all that. And I, I get that. But on the best day, and on the best day, there's people that have come here, and they had a need in their life. I was in a good place. They were in a good place. I preached the word. They got help from the word of God. Amen? Yeah. They got ministered. There's, on the best day, they made decisions for God right here. Amen. They got right with God right here. Amen. On the worst day, they come and fill the world and get nothing. But here's the thing. You know what? On my worst day, I'm tired. And I go home and I go, man, that wasn't much. I'll tell you what. If you don't judge me on my worst message, I won't judge you on your worst day. How about that? Amen. Is that fair enough, Jake? You know, the thing is, what I, I bring up that point is this, though, is that sometimes people look at preachers and they think they're perfect, and sometimes preachers act like they are, and they ain't perfect. They're not perfect. And now, you know, I know guys that act, they'll tell you, they'll, they'll chew guys out for taking a vacation. And they're successful. Why? I guess they run people until they are wore out and just keep putting parts in the machine and their churches, they're big. They'll do all they can. They just promise young man this that's getting out of college and promise this guy that and they get him on staff, run them ragged for a few years and they're gone and new wheel, a new part gets put in the big machine and away they go. And they're running around the country and preaching and, you know, anyways, listen, some guys say they've never been discouraged. You're just not honest. <laughs> I've had guys say you shouldn't tell people that. That you get discouraged. They think they don't think as much of you. Hey, I'm gonna be honest with you. I am just human. I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. And you know, maybe the longer you get to know me, the more human you say, man, I don't know. He's just human. Yeah. Guess what? You say, I'll tell you this. Moses, I read this text to show you one thing. That Moses isn't perfect. Moses failed. And every man is gonna fail. Your greatest men are made of clay. Yeah. The greatest men you know are just made of clay. And you got to realize that. That's the man they're holding the hands of that day. 
So something else. Look at back, go, go back to our starting text, Exodus chapter 17. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. And I know we got folks gone. I hope they're home watching. Amen. I know Brother Delaney and Mrs. Lane do. I get messages every time I'm done. It was really surprising to see them. And others, I know Mickey many times will message me, and others will, and I, I'm glad. I'm glad they're at least watching us at home tonight. Some aren't feeling good this week, and I'm praying for them for sure. Look at verse 12 of Moses, Exodus 17. It says, Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he, he sat there on and Aaron and her stayed upon his hands, and the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. He's just the man. See, I mean, the man got tired. You know, sometimes that people, I don't know if they think preachers never get tired. I don't know. They think, you know, but I'm just a man. I get weary. I need help. Moses is just a man. He was called of God to lead Israel, but he wasn't called to do it alone. Joshua, he said, Joshua, go get that people, get the people and lead that fight. And Joshua didn't leave and linger. There's no discussion. He just did it. Glory to God for Joshua. And Aaron and Hur thought, man, they went up with Moses up on top of that rock. Can you imagine the whole scene? This thing lasted a long time. Moses got tired. They say, helped him out. They went and got a seat for the man they got to sit upon. Why? Because the, the old man was tired. You know, 2 Corinthians 11, 27, 28, he said, Paul said this, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger, thirst, fastings often, cold and nakedness. He goes on and lists, he lists all the troubles and that he's dealt with. I mean, beatings and shipwrecks and, I mean, just a rough walk. And then he said, beside those things that were without, that which cometh upon me daily to the care of all the churches. Now listen, tonight, you know what? I could talk about the murmuring and complaining that Moses had to deal with. I'm not going to do it. It wasn't what the Lord laid on my heart. I could talk about the sons of Korah. Remember the sons of Korah? Yeah. yeah. That didn't go well, did it? You know, I, every once in a while, I, well, we won't go down that road. I'll stop. That wasn't laid on my heart. We'll just keep that one to myself. But you know, that happens, though. People murmur and complain. So people, when they, when they sit and complain about stuff and really don't want to offer to help, it's really just called murmuring and complaining. Amen. Gossip. Murmuring, complaining, listen, you see a problem? Well, help. Well, there's a need. Well, help out, amen. Don't go, well, I'll tell you what, you know, why don't you help? But you know, the burden, you know, even Miriam, you know, even Moses' own family got on to him. You know that? Miriam, his own sister, had trouble with it. Well, that's something a lot of people don't see and don't realize. Sometimes even a preacher's family, you say, no, oh, yeah, it's, you don't know how it's going to go. But Miriam, Miriam, his own sister, you know what? They got on Moses. You know, you know what happened there. What She got leprosy, right? Yeah, she was shamed for a day. But don't be a complainer, be a help. But listen, I, I'm not going to go over. I, I put down in here prayers that Paul asked for. I mean, Paul has a list of things that he didn't, he didn't even ask him. He said, just pray for me in this area. Pray for me in this area. Church after church, there wasn't a request. He said, pray for me in this area. Pray for me in that. What is he asking him to what? hold his hands up? Support him in prayer. I go back to one, one more thought here. The battle was long. I mean, the guy's tired. I mean, he's holding this thing up. I mean, Rebecca, we went fishing the other week. And it was a good day. When you catch a fish so big that you're wore out bringing in the fish, it's a big fish. And she's reeling in this fish. You get it. It's a true story. Right? I'm not lying. I'm preaching now. I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> so she's reeling in this fish, and she's like, I can't do it. I thought, you don't want me reeling in this fish. I'll get the credit for it. I'm going to get the picture. So I... I reached over there, and I grabbed that pole. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time, that line was out over 500 feet. And she's reeling in a 20-pound lake trout. And I'm, like, holding this thing up. And at first, I'm like, after a while, I'm like, <laughs> she's She's grinding on this reel. And, she's, and I'm thinking, I thought, don't, don't quit, girl. 
you don't want me to get the glory for this fish. She reeled that baby in. She did. Boy, I helped hold it up, hold that rod up. She couldn't hold the rod up no more. That thing was just poof, bending down 500 feet of line out, 517, 20 feet of line out. But you know what? Help them hold the line up. You know, that battle was long. The day went on. Brother Ma said, I mean, all day long. This is a long battle. This whole thing just goes on, and it went on, and it went on. I mean, Moses was so tired, he's sitting down. And I mean, they, they were so thoughtful, they went and got the guy a rock. And he's sitting on a rock. And they're like, man, his hands are still going down. And what is the picture of the hands? The rod of God. Man, I'll tell you what, he's getting a hold of God, and again, he's putting all of his dependency upon God. And he was so weak and tired, but they would not let them hands go down. Whether it was just they looked up and saw the man of God up there and the staff above his head, knowing that that's the staff that he parted the Red Sea with, I don't know. But I know this, every time that hands were up, they were victorious. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I'll tell you what, can I say something tonight? Get in it and be in it for the long haul. I, tell, I like to ask people, I don't know if I've asked Silas this, I go, hey, do you like fishing? And usually people go, if I catch fish. They're a fair-weather fisherman. Yeah. Now, I'm a fair-weather fisherman with some kind of fish. Like, in Michigan, it gets cold and nasty. And they have something up there that they call ice fishing. Not happening. I am not sitting on a block of ice to catch a three-inch bluegill. It ain't happening. I've had guys tell me, I worked with these old guys, Bill, would you like to go, go ice fishing with me? I go, no, no. I said, what do you, you catch it? Oh, yeah, oh, man, last week we lit it up. I said, really, what'd you get? Now, if they were going to go out on Lake Erie and get eight-pound walleye, I'm in. <laughs> but he goes, we got, I caught six bluegill. I go, I'm going to go buy, what's that one, frozen fish sticks. I'm, I'll, I'd rather go buy the frozen fish sticks for that. <laughs> I said, <laughs> So, in a sense, when it comes to salmon, we were, you asked my daughter, we're, this captain, he's, we're going out on this charter boat. I paid for these guys' birthday to go on a charter boat, you know. John, back his birthday today, John's, was two days ago. And I, I, I decided I'm going to, the once-in-a-lifetime deal, bought a charter boat. We all went fishing. And uh, I told the guy, the guy goes, well, I don't know, the waves are two to four feet. I looked at him, I said, that ain't nothing. He was starting to come up with excuses to not go out fishing. I go, no, 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 no. He goes, maybe we could troll right in this channel here. I'm going, I ain't trolling no channel. I'm looking at him. I said, I don't have any problem with it. I walked up and leaned on the captain. I did. I went up and leaned on his chair. I go, I don't have any trouble with this kind of weather. He looked at me, and I said, let's go for it. Well, the weather, the weather they got these, uh, like what do they call those buoys out there. The weather buoys are out there, and it says two to four foot waves. And I go, nothing, man. You got a 31 foot here. Let's do it. I said, how long is this boat? He goes, 31 feet. I said, oh, that's nothing. I'd do this in my Starcraft that's 18 feet long. And he goes, well, I don't know. And he's like, I said, no, no, no. I said, I've been, I started the Marine Corps. I said, we got in the old Higgins boats. You know what a Higgins boat is? That's those flat things that come off the Navy ships, and you, you get in those things, they beat you to death. I said, buddy, this ain't nothing. He's looking at me, and Becca's going, I'm glad. She was glad that I'm talking to this guy. We ain't, look at, no fair weather fishermen here, right? Only for salmon and big fish, though. Comes a little stuff. I want good weather, you know. I can be up in Michigan fishing in snow on me if I'm catching salmon, right, Wayne? Wayne used to do that. Hey, you give me a 30-pound king on the end of my line and snow can fly all around me, I'm okay. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, this is like 80 degrees in sunshine. It's okay to be a fair weather fisherman, but don't be a fair weather Christian. Like I said before, we live in some of the, the last days. Christianity is not as popular these days. It's kind of tiring. I was saying they're attacking Christians. I mean, they even went out of their way. They're like, you know, when this guy wouldn't make cupcakes for the gay marriage and, and the cake or whatever, and they took them all, all the way to the Supreme Court. And the couple didn't even want to do it. They were friends with this guy. They did not even want to do it. But you know what? There's people that say, hey, you find somebody, we'll attack them. They're attacking us. They're, they're, they, they want us to be so scared that we just shut up. And Christianity right now, my friend, is not popular like it used to be. You can't be in this because it's popular. No, no, no. We're in a great spiritual battle. And I get tired. Yeah, yeah, I get tired. I need you. I do. I need you. And there's a great battle going on behind the scenes. 
and the souls of men. That's what's at stake here. It really is. The church, that's at stake. Your families, they're at stake. Israel, all of Israel is at stake there. Joshua led the battle. The man of God is on top of the mountain praying for them. And he's got, he's got his helpers right there helping them. And in the end, that's why they were victorious. Listen, don't be in it. Be in it for the long haul. You know, in Galatians 6, 9, he says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Listen, do we get tired? Oh, yeah. We get tired. I'm tired. I know you're tired. Some of you guys go through trial after trial after trial. And oh, Brother Drummond told me the other day uh, something was going on. He goes, well, I know why that's going on. I said, why is that? He goes, because you got the track league. He's absolutely right. That's just another reason why Satan loves us so much. Because we're shipping gospel tracks in the Muslim countries, communist countries, all around the world. Back doors, front doors. We, we've, I mean, we shipped, I forget how many, how many millions of tracks went into Russia, John? 480, 96 million, 490 million, something like that. What? North Korea, we got people that got them in there. South Korea, you name it, they've gotten there. You think Satan likes us? He don't like us. Listen, what I say is, look, listen. The whole, all of Israel was really involved in it. Moses gets credit, he's up there holding the rod, and he was making intercession for him. Amen. He was doing just what God told him to do. Aaron and her were doing just what they said. I just want you to understand the man whose hands they were holding. He is just a man. He's a man who failed. He is just a man. All the honor, all the glory has got to go to God. And Moses made a big mistake when he said, must we fetch water out of this rock? He shouldn't have done that. And smote the rock twice, he definitely shouldn't have done that because that's a picture of Christ. At this point, it's like Christ. He's not getting crucified anymore. I don't need to get saved more than once. I don't get the Holy Spirit more than once. The one time everything, right? Listen, friends, we're in, a, we're in a great battle. What's at stake is the church, the souls of men. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Stand to our feet tonight. Maybe may be different tonight, but I just tell you what. Be not weary well doing why? In due season, we're going to reap if we faint not. There's a lot on the line here. Be in it for the long haul. Don't be a fair with a Christian. Give it all you got till this thing's over. Amen. Be supportive of this old church. Man, with your faithfulness and your prayers, I could take and show you five or six prayers. Paul asked, really didn't ask him. He told him to pray for him in these areas. Well, I preached on that years ago. Maybe we'll bring it up again in a service in the near future here. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And God, there was a great battle. And Moses couldn't do it alone. And there's no doubt a lesson in that right there. And I can't do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. And the man felt inadequate. And everyone called to preach and called to serve full time. They feel inadequate if they're worth anything because they realize one thing, they can't do it on their own, and that's good. Well, God, they got to need to realize if somebody feels called to preach, maybe even here this evening, or serve in a full capacity, they, they're not doing it alone. You're with them. But God, we need other people with us too. We need support. We need help. We need support. And God, I pray that would be the spirit we have, and we're going to give it all we got while we can. And God, support this church and this ministry. And Father, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open tonight. I... Amen. And uh, what song are we going to sing tonight, brother? 350. 350. 350. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him. All the way. I will go with him through the garden. I will go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. 
I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Amen. Yeah, if I could say anything, I need you. Amen. My do I realize, hey, I'm just a man. I get tired. I look at Moses and think, man, that guy really, I think he gets got worn out. Imagine that day when he got mad and he's, you know, must I fetch water out of this rock? And he smites it twice. Are we worn out or not? There's no excuse, and God didn't let it go. And that man, he paid a price, didn't get to go into the promised land. Wow. He's a great man, and yet he was just a man. And every man, every one of them, you know what? He, they're just made of clay. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Father, love these folks, love the church. I do pray. I know we have many of them. I think of Mrs. Blevins. Father, I pray and encourage her. Lord, she's gotten the cancer going, but got her complications. Father, I lift her up to you tonight. God, I, I pray that you do something that we can't do there and touch her body and touch her heart. And God, I do. I pray for, pray for her and pray for Brother DeLang. It was good to see him today. I know he's been down. He's been so sick so long. I Three heart attacks in nine months. And, and now this, it's just been so much to bear. I, I pray for him. I pray you'd touch his body and heal him. It's nothing for you. Your father, there's so many right now, and I know Mickey, he's not doing good. Well, then he's going to have to go to a funeral on the next day and down there in North Carolina, and I pray for him. Be with him. Father, there's so many right now, and I pray for them. And there's others just to go on for the weekend. And, and Father, we pray for their safety coming back. But I pray for this church. I pray for these families that are represented here. I pray for this church, the ministries that are under this church. All around the world, they, it's hard to imagine, hard for me to wrap my mind around, but all around the world, they are dependent upon the ministries that this church is under this church. And God, I pray that you help us continue on. Strengthen us, Lord. That's what Nehemiah said, strengthen our hands. The world, the devil, they just want to discourage us. They want us to be quiet. We mustn't do that. We need to keep doing it all we can while we can. Father, I pray you bless us now as we go our separate ways. And Father, I ask it in Jesus' name.